So one of the things I notice when I'm going through there, there is an issue with Cengage not pushing them directly to Blackboard. Got it. I'm going to go load stuff over in Blackboard, and I was going to do that this weekend. I get ready to do that, and what I notice, a lot of people are not doing things like the quizzes. They're not doing the activator videos or the case scenario animations. Or So all of those assignments, if you go into Cengage and you're missing them, don't do them. They don't take that much time. And when I start moving over zeros, those grades are going to look pretty crappy. I'm also trying to do this because I'm lazy. I'm not going to move them over multiple times. So probably in the next two weeks, I'm going to move those all over. So from week zero to seven, I'm going to move everything over. So if you don't have it done when I move it over, a zero stands as a zero. That said, I've actually got some people who went ahead and done everything, including all the quizzes to the end of the year. Yay for you guys. But make sure you get in there and go do that. So I will, I can, if you have a question about one, is it something you should have done, I can, I can answer that also when you send me an email. So make sure you go in and you do those quizzes, you do the assignments, you do the projects. Oh, well, isn't that fancy? I have the world's largest touch screen assignment. So. We have another assignment that we're going to put work on in a group this week. So your groups, I sense some dynamics. So I, I am tempted to reorganize the groups completely and just do a reshuffle. But I'm not sure how that's going to work. So what, I, what I'm seeing is some of the groups are carried by one person. And in some cases, the groups aren't turning in anything. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Your group project at the end is going to be in lieu of a final. Or was intended to be. But if we can't get groups to work and people to do things together, then we can certainly have the giant, monstrous, horrible final that I don't think anybody wants. So Let's talk about risk, and then I'm going to kind of backtrack. So if you did not turn in the group assignment last week, you're probably okay because I'm going to go over pieces of it and try to point some people in the right direction. Because there were some issues with the ones I, I saw that were turned in. So let's talk about risk really quickly. Or as quickly as I can load a PowerPoint. So what about risk? What are, what are risks? Do we take risks in our daily lives? We do. We do every time. How many of you drove here to class? Most of you. Did you take risks when you were driving? How many of you sped on your way here? I can't have that group. I sped on my way here. I took that risk of getting a ticket. Hmm. Did I take other risks on the highway? Sure. Are there risks of people that are texting on their phone driving over me? Right now it's harvest season. There's combines and large farm equipment. And I will say you've been out in a field 14, 16 hours on a combine or in a driving a tractor and a, and a wagon around. Are you always as awake and alert as you should be when you pull out into traffic? There was a horrible wreck not too long ago on Highway 2 about two weeks ago where a tractor was pulling a baler and a semi ran right up its butt. 80 miles an hour into a 20 mile an hour tractor. It wasn't pretty. So we all have risks. We all do things that we know have risks. So part of that is identifying what those risks are in our project. What are, what are salient risks? What are ones we need to ignore? How do we minimize those risks? So really quickly, what do you do to minimize your risk in a car? Seatbelt on. So statistically, you're better off wearing a seatbelt than not wearing a seatbelt in a car wreck. That seems fair. Are there other things you do? Check your mirrors. Not be intoxicated. Probably good. What about driving between 11 and 4 in the morning? Lights on, but statistically, that is the worst time to drive because there are things like people leaving bars, 
impaired drivers, people are tired. So statistically, that is a horrible, horrible time to drive. But there's other ways we can we can look at risk. What's the other thing we do with risk? So if I run into a pedestrian, what what happens? I get sued or I have to pay. But who actually pays to start with? Do I pay directly right start writing a check to him? Insurance. So we use some mitigation strategies we're going to talk about. And there's some differences that you'll find. So part of that is we have to monitor risk, see what's going on. Not sure how to fix that one. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. So we have to monitor risk, see what's going on. Things change. If the weather suddenly gets cold and we have ice, does that change your decision on whether it's worth it to drive home? You have that risk aversion. You say, well, hmm, maybe, maybe it's not. So I like to use cars because we're all familiar with cars. And we have to figure out ways to manage those risks. And one of the ways we manage them is put somebody else in charge of them. We go buy car insurance because we don't have or don't want to spend $50,000 if somebody gets in a wreck with us. So insurance is a way we do that. And we prioritize those risks. What, what makes sense, what doesn't. So what we are going to do is look at it from that project management side. Now, some of you may be, is anybody in here in the risk management course now? No. Anybody taking it in the spring? Maybe. We're, they will have an entire class about some of these. We're going to give you kind of the highlights in regards to a project. So we talk about this term matrix, and we're going to show you what that is, what a matrix is. So a couple of things in risk management. You want to be up front and early. If something has already happened, you're too late. I want to have strategies in place. And we can't fix all risks. We can't stop them. There's always going to be a risk. But we can minimize the impact or mitigate what the outcome is. Plan for what might happen. Sometimes we just accept it and say, yeah, things are going to happen. So we need problem-solving skills. They go through the entire project. And at the end of the project, we can look at it and say, you know what? We learned some things from this project. And some of those we can imply then to a future project. So earlier we had a discussion about cutting a fiber optic cable. And I will tell you from my days in working in telecom, one of the things we got in a habit of doing, and we looked at it from a risk management strategy, was we would regularly cut people's phone lines to their houses. The reason? It was cheaper to fix it and go on than it was to wait for the local telephone company so we could find out where those phone lines were all the time. Because they didn't always respond to, in that case, it was a dig safe system or 811 now. They didn't always respond. It was quicker just to blow through, put in our own fiber, and then fix where we cut off telephones. Is that necessarily the right way? It sure pissed off a lot of people. But from a risk standpoint, that's kind of the, the attitude we took. On the other hand, from a risk management strategy, I got to cancel a $47 million contract because I had a contractor who wouldn't follow basic safety protocols and OSHA rules and regulations. So there's impacts in these, and we need to think about that in terms of money in a lot of cases. Not that money is the only driving factor, but you're going to see that it's a, a pretty good piece of that. So... The book does this one. I want you, so there's a clinical information system. I'm going to kind of skip that for now. So risks to us on a project are important when they impact us either financially or time. And sometimes that time. So I said we would plot that plow and go right through phone lines because it impacted our time to sit there and wait around. On the other hand, when we ran into something like, hey, we're going to cross a natural gas pipeline, did we adapt a little different strategy in terms of risk? Yes, our risk subject to how do I minimize risk today and in the future in this regard? Standard phone line is probably not going to hurt you. A 12-inch gas line, if you cut into it, is going to hurt you and, and very badly. 
So we look at our projects and we say, what, what can we do? And so one of the things we use is that brainstorming technique. And so we set people down and say, what are the risks in this project? What things could happen that would impact our project? And it's not just Bob could fall down and get hurt, although those are certainly important, but what are risks to the project? What could impact that project, either timeline? We sometimes will establish categories. And so you'll see us start to build this matrix of these are all safety concerns. These are monetary concerns for risk. So one of the risks in a lot of projects is the project manager quits. If it's a very complicated project and the project manager quits, your project is in deep doo-doo. So that's a risk. Nobody's getting hurt physically, but it's a risk. We can see what's happened historically. So what has happened historically on projects we've done that were similar to that? We can use those as gauges to see what happens. Maybe if we're looking at weather as a, an event, we can gauge the area. So if I'm building a highway, hurricanes are certainly an issue. But are they an issue if I'm in North Dakota? But are there weather events that could happen and will happen in North Dakota? It's nearly snow season there. We're in October. So that historical information. And it doesn't always tell you perfect information. The past doesn't always repeat exactly the same. So what we're going to do is you create this risk matrix. So one of the first things you do is you identify a risk. So let's take Peru State College. And we're looking at risk. What is a risk to Peru State College right now? What's the biggest one? Why are we all wearing masks? No. Oh. So if we said... Corona, well, what's our likelihood that we're going to have students that are infected? Pretty high. And we might even categorize those in different bands. What's the degree of impact on our project or on our college? If we said tomorrow we're going to go all online, would that have a severe impact on us? And it certainly did last, last spring. Does that impact our ability to recruit students yeah and if we don't keep students in here we're a business just like anything else it's going to hurt so we want to see what that degree of impact is and then we think about how likely is that to occur and the degree of impact and we also look at that critical path now Peru we don't have a critical path because Peru is an ongoing effort it's not a a project but we may need to think about those activities on that critical path if we have risks associated with them, they're far more vulnerable than other activities. So we build something that's going to start looking like this. So let's say, who can I pick on? Miranda, you have weddings you're planning. Is weather on a wedding day going to be an issue? So especially if you're planning an outdoor wedding event, is rain on the day of the event? Is that going to be severe? Well, impact, low attendance, incur financial loss. So in this case, they're charging for events. So that would certainly have an issue. What can we do? So likelihood of occurrence, low, medium, high, degree of impact. In this case, we say it's high. What's their action? So in other words, how do we start figuring out what to do? In this case, we look at the weather forecast two days before. We assign a person and we have a response. So we say, all right, so we think there's rain. It's two days out. We've got an indoor space reserved. We may need to find some extra volunteers to move people to that for the wedding. And we have a detailed plan on how to deal with it. So this is what we're looking at at this matrix. It's got a lot of information. So road construction. Well, our road construction may not impact our wedding as much. So we might change our, our, our plan here a little bit. So we might say, well, it's going to have reduced attendance, but it's not as likely. In this case, it says it's high, but in our case, maybe we say it's low. Who's in charge? How do we, how do we look at it? And so all of those risks, we assign those criteria, and we start looking at what's most likely to happen. So now we can start to assign responses to those that make sense. 
So here, we said, oh, alternative routes have signs made, post signs along the way, announce in the media. So some way that we can minimize the impact of these events. So the actions. We implement if the risk occurs, prevent or hopefully minimize that. That trigger point then, sometimes we put in there. So weather, that forecast, if we look a couple days ahead, we have a pretty good idea of what's happening. And we can try to see what, what might be other alternatives and what might be other actions that we can take. We assign people or groups or a person for responsibility. And then we have to decide, are we going to avoid it? Are we going to mitigate it? Or do we just kind of accept that risk? So sometimes we just accept it. We say, you know what? I don't know what the outcome is going to be. We just have to have this risk. And so we're going to accept it and say, we're going to move on. Contingency funding is often a good thing. And in fact, in our entire budgeting, typically we budget about 10% of a project for contingency events. In other words, budgeting for something that may happen. We don't know if it's going to happen, but it certainly might. And so we need some kind of a plan for how do we, how do we change this. And if we don't have funding, it's always kind of a problem. Risk response plan, that risk assessment matrix that we create. We can regularly look at it and try to evaluate. Are those appropriate? We can look for new risks. What could else could happen? We could discuss those. So project meetings, we look at them. And then we track what has happened. So both in this project and in future projects, we know what's happened. We have a clear and cut idea. So there's an interesting project going on this weekend in Omaha. Omaha, what's going on in Omaha? So, my girls and my wife are very active racers on BMX bikes. So, Omaha has got to host a national event. So, every weekend there's typically a national event somewhere around the country. Omaha has never had a national event. It's brought there through a lot of contingency planning. So, the contingency plan was Oh, man, the original site we had didn't work. We're going to try for Omaha. That's great for the Omaha community. It will bring in about 2,000 people, bike enthusiasts. They're going to spend a ton of money at the track there. But in that project, they look at a lot of different contingencies. They've had to work with the uh, city and the state for how do we deal with this COVID issue? How do we physically get people in and out of this park? So if you've never been to the park in Omaha, it's an interesting area. It's a reclaimed landfill. So every few years they repave the road because it gets all humpy dumpy. But for this event, they need to bring in vendors, need to bring in trucks. USA BMX brings in trucks. And so they've had to work around all this. So they had contingency plans. If I can't get the truck in the way we thought, we'd make it away. A what if the ground collapses underneath our truck? Oh, holy doly. So it's a project, and what they've done is they've built a, a map at every event they went to, and they said, these are the things that can happen. What is our response to that? What about weather? What do we do if weather moves in? Well, they, they do some risk management. So one of the things they do is they do something called sealing the track. They put a, essentially a plastic coat over the dirt, or they will use tarps and try to preserve that dirt. Because if it's rainy and muddy, well, you're kind of out of the game for that weekend. So they have all these risk management pieces that they're going to put in there. But they track those. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is they track all that, and then they can observe, all right, so in Louisville, Kentucky, this didn't work. What else can we do to implement those changes? What can we, what can we take to the local tracks and try to provide for that? So there's a lot of different risks that we can have. And so we just kind of touched on a few of them. So technology. What might be a technology risk? It doesn't work. Okay. So, technology risk. Does something doesn't work? What if our project is to build a new app? And as we're building that app, we looked over and our competitors are also building one, but they're going to release it three weeks before we do. Is that a risk of technology changing? 
what if we're building an app and then we see that, that Apple is going to release a new operating system for their phones and ours are no longer going to be compatible and we have to start over? Yeah. Technology is a, is a really big risk. And technology has life cycles, definitive life cycles. So we have to be careful of that. What about human risk? What might be a human risk? Somebody's sick. We have staff go elsewhere. Certainly in this pandemic issue, it's hard to find employees willing to work in some cases. Occupational hazards could happen. People, for whatever reason, lose their brain. What if they steal from our, our funding source? Embezzle. That is a real issue in a lot of a lot of organizations. So we have all of those issues. Oh, usability issue. What's a usability issue? That could be. It's not easy. If the world and all these things were easy, it could be an issue. And so some of these fall into different categories. But think about, you're trying to hire somebody to operate construction equipment. Do you need them to have certain criteria and levels of skill? Yeah. Otherwise, people get hurt. People can get killed very easily. So every time I drive through Topeka, because I did a, a project where we went from Topeka, literally to Lincoln, Nebraska, and I get outside of Holton, just south of Holton, there's some hills up there, and they were... I watched a guy roll a backhoe down a hill. And I will tell you, I have never, when I pulled up, I was like, holy crap, I hope you're okay. Because that backhoe somersaulted three times down the hill because he wasn't familiar with the equipment, didn't know how to counterweight himself to stay up on a side slope. you got to be careful. There's always those kinds of risks. What about our team risk? Can teams fall apart? Can we have low-performing teams through things like social loafing? Maybe communications issues inside of the program? No. There's all kinds of risks in here. Strategic or political risk? Oh. What, what do we mean by that? Can government regulations change and cause our project to, to differ? Yeah. Certainly, we, we see in this pandemic, what about all these businesses that were closed back in March? If you were running a project and you were building something and you were told you, you have to stop, that's an issue. But governmental laws change. Local issues can change your outcome very quickly. So strategic, and then you have this political risk. So there's a really great story I have where many years ago in the land of Chicago. Has anybody been to Chicago? Great food. Pizza's okay. If you like your pizza about that thick. Chicago is probably the most corrupt political city in the world. So our plan, and I was working with the company to develop a plan to essentially create a fiber optic loop around the downtown area of Chicago. And the, there was a business model attached to it and some other pieces. But to get approval, we had to go to the city council. We had some funding through a, a venture capital firm. This is going to be a great idea. We were going to make some money. Because all of those businesses wanted connected. So this is 20 plus years ago. They all needed connected. It wasn't as easy as it is today. They needed connection. They wanted data. They wanted pipelines. And we were shot down politically. They said, no. We will never give you approval to build this in our county. It's this county. Oh, okay. And we tried a few things that we were repeatedly shot down. So I'm looking at some of the trade magazines a few months later, and oh, the city of Chicago has come up with this great idea to put in Metro Fiber. What? And you're partnering with, and they listed who they were partnering with to do this project. And the more I looked, it looked exactly like this project I presented to them and given them the details on how to do it. So we are. Political risk. Same kind of idea. They built it. They made some money. I didn't. Life's great. We move on. But there's always that idea of political risk. So shifts in, in local and state and federal government can cause changes to how things are going to go. 
If you're doing things for a governmental agency, that's certainly an issue. Because different people have different viewpoints. Strategically, we can have different issues. So, the economy changes. And as the economy changes, some businesses flourish, some, for, some don't. So weirdly, weirdly, colleges typically are, are a different breed. So if the economy is tanking, do you think colleges are going up in numbers or down? They're actually going up. And it makes sense when you think about it because as people lose their job and they try to figure out how they can retrain themselves, education spikes. If the economy's doing great and everybody's making money and their jobs are great, you're not going to take your time and go back to school, are you? No, you got a great job. Why would I want to do that? So strategic risk can be an issue. So in this case, we look at a couple more risks. So maybe we have end users. They don't want to work correctly. Maybe our, the outcome has changed. Users are having to do more queries. That might be an issue. Software has some kind of an integration issue. All right, that touch screen is going to either make me very happy or drive me crazy here. So when we go through those, those are the different kinds of things we can do. What we want to do is come up with a way that we can assign which ones are the highest priority. And like everything, we want to do it as quantitatively, in other words, numerically, as possible. So one of the ways we do that is we start building a risk matrix and we start looking at impacts. So, we come back into week eight. So, notice this little guy down here. If I can get him to load, load properly. It's our buddy Excel. I love Excel. Excel makes me happy. Here is what I think is an interesting way to do this. So we have our classification. So in other words, is it strategic or is it personnel? Risk description, what is happening? Impact severity and risk probability. But instead of just saying it's high and the risk probability is high. So in other words, we're going to assign those a scale. So we're going to put them on some kind of a scale. And quite frankly, it doesn't really matter much. So different ones you'll find will say, well, we're going to scale this one to five. One to five makes sense to me. There's some scales that it's a percentage. There's some scales. One to five makes sense. It's fine. Perfectly. Great. I like one to five. We can all put something and say in a scale of one to five. So we're going to put a risk category in there. And I'm going to say maybe this is strategic. And that risk description is economy collapsing. So on a scale of 1 to 5, and we don't even know what our product is until we show you what it is, but let's say this is for our college. Is the economy collapsing? What's the impact severity of that? So it's high, but where, what would we say? Maybe a 3, maybe a 4? Would it be a 5? Oh, so maybe we need to think about that and put it differently because there are different ways to look at it. So maybe we say this and we add a little content and we say student population decline. So now if I say impact severity, what does that tell me? Would that be a five? All right. And so we say, all right, that's a five. And our risk probability, in other words, what's the likelihood for this to happen? And this is where a lot of times we have probabilities and people will put in percentages. Ooh, that's a 90% chance it will happen. Honestly, if we're going to do one to five on one scale, I'm going to do one to five on the other scale so I don't weight them weirdly. So what is the chance that the economy is going to collapse and student population is going to decline? I'm going to say that's a three making stuff up out of the blue, that risk score then becomes impact times risk probability, and I'm going to say that's a 15 then. And then we come up with a response plan, and we have who's responsible, 
A timeline, in other words, when do we need to become aware of it? What's our timeline for responding? So timeline is kind of similar to that trigger. What is triggering that event? So do we look six months out for financial projections? So so maybe a description would be retiring faculty. What does that impact severity on the college if we have do retiring faculty? You think it's a five? Hmm. I'm going to hope we have enough people coming in. I'm going to say, wow, I'm not valuing myself very much, but I'm going to say that's a two. And I'm going to do that for numeric purposes. What's the risk of that happening? And I think what happens now in a lot of our colleges, what's happening is Corona has increased that risk. Everybody agree? Because I've seen several people at Wayne retire. They didn't want to teach in a classroom. They were, they were scared. Understandably so. So I'm going to put that one at a four. Well, two times four is eight. We've discovered that there's something new that's happening with Corona. I just keep going back to it because it's a good one to go with. That Corona eats fiber optic cables. It might be. So, it's kind of hilarious. We'll throw it out there. But impact severity, would that be severe? Oh, yeah. Our world revolves around that. But only one scientist in China managed to make that assumption. So we're going to say it's a one. And so we have a risk of five. Now, I managed to do this so they're all in, in reverse order. But what we would do then is create this list of all of our risks. And we would create a risk score, and we would fill in the rest of this chart. That risk score is how we're going to sort that. And those items that are at the top of that list, then, based on greater likelihood of probability, greater impact, those are going to be scored much higher. So maybe I put in weather. And so this doesn't have to be a project. This gets used on ongoing hurricane. So, honestly, impact, it might be really bad, but what's our probability? Zero or one or whatever our lowest one is. On the other hand, what if I had a tornado? Are we in an area that tornadoes could happen? Or Yeah. And the impact severity... If you guys have ever seen what a tornado can do, it's pretty miraculous the amount of damage it can do. So I'm going to say that the impact might be a 4. Risk probability. I think in here in certain times of the year it might be a 4. Now I've got a 16. That might be something we need to respond with plans for. So do we need to figure out a way to get students out of their dorm rooms? Yeah, I would think so. Do we need to find safe places for them? Yeah. So we go through and we build this risk matrix on our project. And we project, we take our people, we say, hey, what kind of risk can you see? And we'll build those. So in a lot of cases, we'll build this and we'll do this by consensus. Because what I think for a risk probability, we've already seen may be different than in somebody else. So can we pool everybody's values together and do an average? Sure. So this gives us a quantitative tool to start organizing those risks and start seeing what we need to deal with and what we don't. Obviously, a hurricane, we don't need to put a lot of effort into that. It's going to be fairly low. But in this case, a tornado might be fairly high. So let's put one that should scare everybody. Well, let's call it this. Let's call it... Huh. Shooter on campus. Mm. That's one we don't like to talk about a lot. But what is what is the impact severity of a shooter on campus? Not necessarily just from can they cause damage to a small number of people in most cases, 
But what is that in terms of the damage to the college, in terms of your, your students wanting to come back, safety? I'm going to say it's probably a five. We probably really do need to talk about it. So now we're in an age where we've got corona rampant. We're all wearing these masks. We're all paranoid. The news media is beating in our ear all day long. We know that mental health issues are, are prevalent. Do we have enough mental health resources? Is this an area where easy access to firearms, no matter your beliefs, because quite frankly, I'm at a gun range quite a bit, but is there easy access to firearms? Is that a risk that, that we need to probably move higher? What do, what do you think the, the risk score might be for that? Or that risk possibility? Three? Because the one thing I will say is this this area in the Midwest, we seem to be a little more conservative with our values, and I'm probably less worried about somebody walking into on, into campus. But I also know some other things. If that happens on our campus, how long does it take for a response from our local sheriff's department to get here? A minute? It does. If they're in Auburn, Nebraska, they're ten minutes away. We have, we have a, a system that supposedly alerts you on your phone. So let's think about that one for a second. You have a shooter on campus. Do you want your phone blowing up? You're trying to hide in a closet somewhere and your phone is blowing up. We don't have a paging system on our entire campus to say, hey, there's something going on and, and TJ Majors run away. I'm not trying to make you guys scared or paranoid or anything, but... Our defense has not necessarily been real well thought out in some cases. We did put new door locks and new doors in there. That's good. But if you're very determined, and so in my cybersecurity class, one of the things we talk about is physical security. So the doors, the way they built them here, I can get any one of you to get into that door in probably 20 to 30 seconds or less. It opens in, in this case. So in that case, it's actually good because that means the hinge hinges are on the inside. But it's also a very easy door, so there's a weird disconnect between security and accessibility. So if you look at that door hinge, that's one of the doors. The, the door hinges is designed for ADA compliance. That also means that big hook in there, I can catch it with, if I don't have a purpose built tool, I can actually take a coat hanger very easily, reach up and snap that down. And so I show my, my Cyber 360 class students, we actually practice downstairs. And I had some high school students once, the high school business contest, probably shouldn't have done that, got a little trouble for that. We showed them a couple of different ways to break through the door. And in that case, down in the computer lab, there's other two other things that happen. One, there's a window, so you can see in, so it makes it easier to break open the door. Those doors swing out, which means the hinge hinges are where? On the outside. And so we pop them out, and you can pop them out pretty quickly, and then the door is just hanging there open. There are security measures for all of these things, but we didn't do those. We put new locks on, so we made some progress, and we didn't have the doors. So previously, the doors, if you don't remember what they look like, they had these long glass panels, and so they were... A little scary in terms of that. Do I think it's really going to happen at Peru State College? No. But is it a concern? Do we do we need to worry and maybe think about those odds? And that's what we're trying to do when we build these matrices, is we're trying to get everything that can possibly happen and think about what might might happen. So when I'm driving down the road and I'm thinking about risk, two years ago we're coming back from Christmas. We went down to Orange Beach, Alabama. Great place to go spend Christmas, by the way. I will heartily endorse it. Beautiful beaches. It's their off-season, reasonably cost for driving back. And I'm tooling along, driving exactly the speed limit through Mississippi. You guys are going to let me get away with that one? Okay, exactly the speed limit. I have a lead foot. It is on not an unknown thing. I'm driving probably 80 miles an hour, middle of the night, 11 o'clock, whatever it was. There's a lot of risks on a highway. So I'm looking at other vehicles. 
here's the risk I did not take into account. I did not take into account that there was going to be a scrapper with his truck ahead of me. And that in that truck was going to be a kitchen stove that's going to fall out in front of me at 80 miles an hour. I couldn't put that on a risk matrix. So there's always things we're going to miss. So now when I'm driving, because now we've had that and we've looked at past history, do you think I'm looking ahead for scrapper trucks now? Yeah, a little paranoid about them. And, and luckily, I will say this, the one that I had one of the bigger vehicles with at that time. Because if I would have been in, I like to drive Priuses because I'm cheap. Had I been in that Prius, I think my wife and my children probably would not have made it. Because that, that was very tough. I also learned things about 911 systems in other states. In this case, in Mississippi, it sucked really bad. And I'm glad nobody was seriously injured. Or they'd probably not have made it through because 911 hang up, hung up on us not once but twice. So first time we, so we, we're off to the side of the road. We call 911. We don't know where we're at. We're driving through Mississippi, right? So we tell them which highway we're on, or whatever. And she goes, "Well, now you have to call the local sheriff." Click. And we also had really crappy cell phone signal slash internet access at that time. So we find the state patrol's office. We call them, and they say, oh, okay, we'll send out a trooper. And so, well, where are you? Somewhere on Interstate 57 or whatever it was. Okay. Hey, why don't you call 911, and they'll ping your cell phone, and then they'll send us the, the address where you're at. Okay. Hey, can we get a, can you ping us? The state patrol wants that so they can come find us and start figuring out what's going on. Nope, we don't do that. Click. So, we go back to state patrol and we try to identify where we're at and they finally send a true breath. Now, none of us are hurt, thank goodness. I will say my underwear was probably a little damaged, but we were okay. Trooper arrived and it was a little over an hour after he left. It took him quite a while, and he figured it out. Trooper was really nice, and I will say, really great guy. We talked to him. He had just worked an accident scene where one of his former partners was killed in a traffic wreck like half an hour before. I get it, we weren't, but it was a particularly horrible, horrible realization that had anything went different in that, had I not been able to keep that vehicle upright and we rolled in the ditch, and we're trying to get treatment, I'm not sure how it would have happened. The other truly weird thing in terms of risk mitigation, the guy actually stopped down the road, backed all the way up to pick up his, his appliance that he that fell off. And I was able to get his tag number, and he acted back up about the same time the trooper arrived. And they had an interesting conversation. So my insurance was actually really, really handled pretty nicely from that standpoint, except for the fact for whatever reason, they decided to fix this vehicle. So, it was, I, have, I have never seen a vehicle that destroyed that somebody wanted to fix. It's not right now, and it's sitting in my driveway. But it was a Nissan Pathfinder. Great vehicle for hauling six people down the road. But it was $18,000 in damage to, to a four-year-old Pathfinder that was worth less than what they paid to fix it. I'm not really sure how that worked, but it's still sitting there. So, but it's things I wouldn't have thought of. And so that's part of what we're doing on this is we're trying to find things that you wouldn't have thought of. That's why we're doing this in a team approach. So, you have a team assignment this week. Trying to look at the time. Okay, that clock must be... All right, so let's introduce this idea. On Thursday, we're going to go back over the ES, EF, and all those assignments and kind of look at that one start you on it and so we'll give you some some fun stuff for this weekend so what do i need to do this week make sure you go do the quiz make sure you do the animation there's a quiz with it there is a project risk quiz that's in here make sure you do those here is where you get to make a couple decisions so that risk matrix that i just showed you is here and there are three files three different companies 
I don't care which one you do. You have to pick one as a group and do that. So step one, I have to pick a an assignment. So one of them, the one that I think is the most interesting, weirdly, is the Deepwater Horizon. Do you guys remember Deepwater Horizon? Drilling rig out in the Gulf of, of Mexico. So there's an article on it. You are then applying that risk matrix. So you read about the project, you apply that risk matrix to it. So you you brainstorm, you create the matrix, you add as much content as you can in there. That's going to be your, your group assignment. So in that group, you need to pull together, figure out which one of those you would like to do. So there's a software project, there's a couple of other ones. So you pick whichever one you want to do. Don't let me sway you on that. So your group gets to do that. You are going to create a risk matrix. You should easily be able to put 20 items on that risk matrix. Quality, good items. It will not take you as long as you think it will, but it is going to have you doing some brainstorming, and you need to come up and, and find that. Yes, you are going to use that, that sheet right there, and you can use it. You can modify it. If you find something that you really want to add to that, send me an email. It may be a great idea. Is that the one? Yep. Yep. There's an outline. So this risk matrix right here, that one I had open and was filling in, you're going to do the same thing. What I would encourage you to do, though, is I would probably put a formula in there so you didn't have to hand calculate it. That way, if you change some of your values. Your attendance today, I am going to drop out. But the question was, what is CPI? So what is CPI? So what is CPI? And how do I figure that? So cost performance index. So it's a ratio of what? So we have actual cost. And we have economic value. So we're going to go over those again and try to figure out that group project that, for lack of trying, and I know I wasn't here so we couldn't go over it, but I only had one group turn anything in. I cleared that out. So we're going to kind of start over on that. So we're going to do Thursday is going to be kind of a homework, work on these projects, do things in here. So be, don't know what I dropped, be here. We're in this room for the rest of the semester. So it would behoove you if you wanted to to bring a laptop, and I assume a lot of you already have them with you. So there's kind of the cause of the greater good. I didn't want to teach an accounting course side by side while you guys are in there also. So make sure you've read Chapter 8. Read about risks. Go through and make sure you do those. Before I get bored on a weekend, make sure you go in and do all those Cengage pieces if you haven't done them. Because there's some people that have not done those. Zeros are bad. I hate zeros. But they're easy to put in, unfortunately. All right, any questions? Anybody want to slightly use kitchen stove? Okay, good. It ended up through the windshield and other places. So. It was, my language skills, I will say, were remarkably not great at that point either. There was there was a lot of bad skills.